If you like our content, please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking that subscribe button. We'd really appreciate it. And for more strategic tips on international tax and wealth planning, subscribe to our email list and follow us on LinkedIn. Links are below. Who controls my trust when I die? This is always something that we discuss in detail with clients because they want to make sure that their trust is managed responsibly after their death naturally. Uh, but before we get into answering this question, if you're not familiar with trust or foundation lingo, you may want to check out our introduction to trusts or introduction to foundation videos to learn a little bit about trust and foundation basics and then come back and check out this video. If you already know what a protector, a settler, and beneficiaries are, then you're probably good. Keep on watching. Before we get into the details of this video though, a little disclaimer. This presentation is prepared for education purposes only. This presentation is not legal, tax, or any other type of advice. Each individual's circumstances are different. You should seek legal and or tax advice to address any specific questions you may have. Let's get into it. If you're using a private trust company, and a private trust company, as you may know from some of my other videos, is a company that you set up for the specific purpose of acting as trustee of your trust. So, if your trust is being managed by a private trust company, the private trust company doesn't die when you do, so the private trust company can continue to manage your trust. What is important though is to have good succession planning provisions in place to make it clear who's going to manage the PTC after your death. For example, who's to serve on the PTC's board? Some people like to limit it to only family members so that the decisions are always only made by the family. Some settlers want it to only be their trusted advisors or trusted friends that are on the PTC board to the exclusion of the family, and yet other settlers want it to be a combo, right? With some family members, some trusted advisors, maybe some trusted friends. So it's important that that be specified in a proper you know, su succession plan for the PTC's management so that the board continues to operate the way you want it to post your death. Now, the other question then comes up is, how are the successors going to be appointed. So one, it depends on how your PTC is owned, right? So if you owned your PTC personally and you left that to one or more heirs, then they could, for example, vote on who the PTC's board should be comprised of. A lot of people choose not to do that though and choose to have the PTC owned by either a purpose trust or a purpose foundation. And that is often managed by a professional trustee and they don't necessarily want that professional trustee then choosing the board of, of their PTC. So they, they, I mean, there's a lot of flexibility in how to do this. So you know, one example is you can have members of the board choose their own successors, right? So during their lifetime while they're still serving, they can name a successor that says in the event of my death, incapacity or resignation, this person should serve, right? Or board members can vote to fill vacancies, right? So let's say you have a board of five and one person resigns, the other four would vote to fill that vacancy. You could also make it that a majority of the adult beneficiaries of the trust vote to fill that vacancy. And if you have a protector, a lot of times the protector would fill that role, right? They would have a right to name the vacancy, uh, to fill the vacancies on the PTC's board. So you have a lot of options there. What's important is that you're just mindful of it and you really think through how you want to stru structure the protector provisions of your PTC so that it continues to operate efficiently and effectively after your death. The other option, of course, and some people opt for this, is they say, well, you know, listen, when I die, I don't want the complications and things that go along with the PTC. I just want to turn over the management of the trust to a professional trustee. While this is a good option, one thing that a lot of people don't think about is the challenge that exists today 
in getting onboarded with a professional trustee. It is a lot of work and it is a time consuming process, right? So if your trustee just simply says, well, when I die, give it to a professional trustee and the protector should pick one, uh, it's not gonna happen immediately, right? So for if you want your trust to be managed by a professional trustee after your death, it's a good idea to get that professional trustee onboarded during your lifetime, right? So that means getting through the KYC, getting the trust fully onboarded, and keeping them apprised of what's going on with the trust. So in the event of your death, you're fully onboarded, the trustee's up to speed on what's going on, and they can take over in a moment's notice. That's super important, and I think one aspect of one aspect is often forgotten for clients who want a professional with trustee to take over after their death. And of course, if you're using a professional trustee, the professional trustee would just continue to manage your trust after your death. Nothing would change other than your death, which sucks. But the professional trustee would continue to manage the trust. It is important though that if it is being managed by a professional trustee that you do have some provisions for removing and replacing that professional trustee in the event it becomes necessary or desirable at some point. Again, this is often something that would be accomplished by having a protector have this power, right? So you have a protector who has the power to remove and replace the trustee, in which case it's important to have proper successor provisions for the protector, right? So if the protector dies or becomes incapacitated or resigns, that there's that the role is automatically filled in, in an automatic and, and structured way. Um, so that's very important to keep in mind. And then of course, you always want to think about a letter of wishes. I find that this is something that unfortunately is often forgotten. A letter of wishes is a document that a settler of a trust drafts to give the trustee guidance on how they want the trustee managed and the, its assets distributed. Now this isn't a legally binding document, but it's intended to give the, the trustee an understanding of what the settler's intent and what his, what his wishes are, right? So this would often say things, you know, I want my kids treated equally, I don't want my, my kids being spoiled, and then also sort of the definition or how the settler defines spoiling the kids so that the trustee has a better understanding of what the trustee want, right? Or can say, stay away from risky investments, or I like these types of investments, or different things. I mean, it can almost include anything in a letter of wishes. And in reality, the more detailed, the more robust it is, the more information the trustee is gonna have, and the more that they're gonna be able to effectively manage your trust assets after your death in, in accordance with your wishes. And so I think the letter of wishes is something very important to give to a professional or a private trust company during your lifetime and to go over it with them, answer any questions they have. And the letter of wishes is always something that you can update during your lifetime. But again, I think it's super important that you have one regardless of whether you're using a professional or a private trust company. I hope that you found this video informational and that you like the content. We always appreciate you taking the time to watch our videos. Thank you so much.